So I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight and to have a chance to um, participate in your interest of Dharma practice and maybe give you a bit of help and uh, help you to kind of understand maybe a bit better how to go along with the, the path of Dharma practice. So um, as usual, Tonight, we will uh, take the five precepts for those who want, you know. So we'll go to the, I didn't mention it before, but um, it's on page 128, 128, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we just keep it simple. Uh, we we'll just have it, uh, those who want to take the five precepts, you, we can, you know, we, 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 are, if somebody can do the request, I don't think any anybody maybe is so. Um, huh? Yeah. Okay. So, are you there? I can't see anybody. So, I just assume that you can hear um, what I'm saying. And uh, is there someone who can? Ask for the precept, please. <laughs> it doesn't look much. Okay. <laughs> Are you all muted? Can you hear me? Uh, they can hear you. Uh, they can unmute if they want, sister. Okay. Okay. So what I think we'll start with, I, I was just asking. Is there I, I can ask if I know what to, to read from uh, the book. Okay, well, don't, don't, why don't you do that? Huh? Okay. Well, I need the, to know what to read. Do you know, I think we just go start with just Namuta Sabagiwato. Okay, let's start with that. So. I assume that those who take the precepts have asked for it, asked for them. So we don't need to do more than that. Okay. So I will do it. I'm going to say Namotasa Bhagavatu Arahato three times. And after I have chanted it three times, then you can do it also yourself three times. And then after that, for the each refuges, we just have I chant one line and then you chant one line after me, the same line. Huh? So let's start. <clears throat> Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambutasa Nice up to your turn. Okay. When you're finished, we go to the precept, to the uh, refuges. Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Sangham Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dutti Yampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutti Yampi Sangham Saranang Gachami Dutti Yampi Buddham Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tati 
Tatiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. <clears throat> and then ti saranagamana nitwitam. And you say ama aye. Okay, and now we go to the precepts, the five precepts. Panati pata veratmani sikapadam samadhyami. And you repeat in Pali. And in English, afterwards, I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana veratmani sikapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kamesu, oh sorry, <clears throat> Kamesu mi chachara veratmani sikapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Okay, Musawada we ratmani sikapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura meraya majapamadatana veratmani sikapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which leads to carelessness. Imani pancha sikapadani silena sugatinyam di silena boga sampada. Silena ni butinyanti tasama silan wisotaye. So you finish by saying sadhu sadhi three times. And then you bow at the end to the three refuges. Okay. So now we can take all the refuges and the precepts away from the screen. And we will continue with our meditation practice, which I will be guiding you, uh, for, which, for which I will be guiding you. So you remember to when you, just a few words before you start, you know, when you are invited to practice formal meditation, notice how many ideas you have before you even start about how your meditation should be going. Just verify in your mind if you have already a full agenda about how you're going to meditate and get a good, good meditation and then struggle or be really stressed out because by the end of it, you work so hard that you're exhausted. 
So my role will be just to remind you to relax, please. Keep your mind free from all kind of ideas about how you should be. Forget about should. Just look at the reality of the here and now and enjoy what you see, what you feel, what you, what you hear. And every experience that comes through your mind now, you just receive it with as much peace as you can have, you know, and receive it with loving kindness, with basically you receive it you know, not with aversion, anger, and frustration, but just you can see neutrally, you know, it's just as it is. You receive things as they are, rather than as they should be. Yeah, and so on. There's a lot of ideas about how you should meditate and how you should be and so on. So this is just a few words of encouragement before you start. Yeah? Let go of the past, <laughs> let go of the future, let go of time altogether, and just be present here and now. Sit com comfortably, and you know, so your spine is elongated, so your chin is sli slightly tucked in, so you can feel your spine lengthening upward. And then you notice, just no, don't go into an, another agenda you read in books right now. Just notice what's going on now, just the body, you know, the body sitting, the mind maybe uh, occupied with a lot of stories, thoughts, and so on. You know, just notice the general sense of what's happening here and now without any particular ideas of how it should be or where you should go and so on. I'm not going anywhere anyway. What you do by sitting quietly, you let your mind relax, you let your mind, you know, unentangled with new things, new ideas, new feelings, new, you know, you just let life come through naturally, but you're not planning this, this or that right now. You just, you're conscious, mindful, aware of doing nothing right now just being here now, but the, the mindfulness is what you're cultivating, the presence of mind, the presence of awareness. It's like a, more like a listening. And if you want to get a sense of what it is when you meditate right now, you just listen inwardly. You do nothing, you just can hear. And for the first few minutes in you know, a meditation, for a little a short time, you can help the mind to slow down, to calm down, not by doing anything, simply by letting it be. Notice if your mind is buzzing with lots of ideas that you had to think about during the day or a lot of activities that are being sort of 
turn into memory right now. You can spend a little bit of time just noticing the body from the top of your head, sweeping slowly down to the feet. It's a very good exercise to really being fully connected to your physical body, to bring the mind into the here and now, and to simplify just being with any sensations or any feelings or any you know, of the body what you see in the sense of the, the feeling of heaviness or lightness the, maybe you have some pain in some parts of the body and you can generate as you're doing that you basically you are investigating the body gently with a uh, with kindness kindness means patience and acceptance and just being in the moment fully And this refuge in awareness enables you to see things in a completely different way than when you are absorbed, attached, identified with your mind and body. So what happens when you are with awareness, mindfulness, presence of mind, that you can see your body truly as it is, changing, not satisfactory and little by little you notice that this is not something that belongs to you you can control the body up to a certain point but as you look more closely through your practice of meditation you can really see much more deeply and clearly that all our experience inwardly or are we really in a constant state of change? And that's, you could say, the part of meditation that's very liberating to know that things are changing. And we know that when pleasure is present, it doesn't last. When that misery is present, it doesn't last. But what lasts is a clear view on life, on the, the life of your mind, the life of your body. You can see more clearly. Yourself. This is also learning of being patient, very patient with what the Buddha call an unsatisfactory mind. It's not something you want to dwell as a refuge, dwell in as a refuge. Your mind is not a refuge. I mean, a conditioned mind is not a refuge. It's a constant flow of heavens experiences the mind is constantly in movement in a state of moving moving if you examine the body you can see that the sensation of the body don't last for very long even the same sensation is also in a move in a state of movement 
is not static, it's not fixed. The energy of our body is not static and it's not fixed, it moves all the time. Seeing change enables you to follow the habit of grasping. Grasping is a stress of wanting reality to be as you wish maybe it to be, but it is not, it's changing. So this is something you can really examine in your meditation now. And once the mind is a little calmed down and is able to stay with the present moment, then you're just a silent, patient witness, listener. is capable of just staying here and now without having to constantly run here and there and everywhere. And have the patience to bring it back into the present moment, bring your attention back into the present moment right now. That's what meditation is teaching us, to be with the present moment rather than the thoughts about the past and the future. not thinking that the present moment is better than this or that. This is just a work of practice right now, that's all. Then you can see the result in yourself as you develop this uh, ability to return to the here and now again and again.
Maybe you can notice, notice now where your mind is at. Is it still very active or things have calmed down? Are you feeling more relaxed or more tense? Make sure that your awareness, this mindfulness awareness, open up the mind, broad, broaden. The way we perceive the mind, the body, maybe all very tightly together, but when you really uh, sit quietly, you maybe you even, even have a sense that the, the body may seem like there's no separation between inside and outside. The mind, when it's become peaceful and quiet, you, you can feel that space, it's, which is usually filled up with a lot of movement, activity, events, memories, stories, and so on. So you can appreciate maybe the space that this mindfulness practice offers as a new perspective. At the end of your meditation, you can 
maybe spend a few minutes just wishing you well, wishing you to be at peace, wishing others to be well and wishing others to be at peace. And maybe a sense of appreciation for your life that is guiding you towards seeing the mind in, the, in different ways, seeing the mind from the point of view of awareness, mindfulness, rather than delusion, ignorance, or illusion. Big shift. So just to have a sense of gratitude towards oneself, towards the Buddha, towards all the things that brings transformation to your life for the good. You can dwell in that sense of blessings of your meditation, your life, your, your people you know. So you can open your eyes gently. You can maybe stretch your legs, stretch your arms, relax your back for a few seconds. How do you feel after meditation? You feel good? <laughs> do you feel good? Yeah? Sometimes it's just a neutral feeling, isn't it? Just something, not nothing much happening. Maybe a, a calming down of uh, mind and body and just nothing too, too special. Nothing special at all, maybe just being here now, present. So this is something you can do in your daily life. Just five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, makes a big difference. So I encourage you, all of you, just to take time to remember, to train the mind so that it really dwell, you know, more regularly into that refuge of Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Buddha means the, this word is used to see the, the one who knows or the mind that is able to mirror what we see in ourselves. Dhamma is a teaching of the truth or the words of the Buddha, the realization of the Buddha. And the Sangha is, uh, 
you know, represents uh, the monastic Sangha, the enlightened Sangha, the, um, you know, sometimes it was translated to me in the early years, the Cheta says, you know, the, the pure heart. Yes. The heart that is um, in touch with reality. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to write them down on your, you know, they, they will remain uh, uh, anonymous. So you don't need to worry about writing whatever you want to write. They won't have, your name will not go anywhere. So, but if you have any queries, please do not hesitate. I'll say a few things about the aspect of speech, you know, some are watched you know, in the In the uh, no in the noble noble eightfold path, you know, you have the, you know this aspect of ethic. So what you what you did redetermine tonight was the uh, five precepts, and one of them is samawacha. You know, musawada is another word for it, and uh, you know the the right um, you know. For the, for the right speech, yeah. And so sometimes one gets very focused when you when you, you you can read those words, and they seem to be very true. You know, who does not want to have right speech? Everybody would love to have right speech. But if one forgets that the trip, the pass in which the Samawacha or yeah, Musawada precept is included is a path of training. So remember, we're not there, we're learning. We're training the mind to be more attuned with what the Buddha is encouraging us to practice and to realize. What we forget very often with the practice is that Everything else that is not Samawacha are our teachers. Do you understand? So sometimes we can be feeling disheartened because you realize your speech is not maybe uh, looking like right speech. And then you go down in the, you get depressed because you missed something again, you said something you regret, remorse. And all that comes up and uh, you don't feel good. Sometimes you don't feel good and you get you feel so bad that you say, I, I don't care about all this. I don't care. I say what I want. I'm not, you lose maybe, uh, you know, the inspiration or even the, the desire to train the mind, to help the mind to be more skillful with right speech. Because the mind, you know, our mind, our conditioned mind, can understand through our thinking. We can understand very quickly what's right and wrong. We can tell everybody else what's right and wrong. You notice it's easy to recognize it in other people around you. And maybe it's good to be reminded that we ourselves might be doing the same thing. But it's more hard to see that because it's become a habit in us. And this habit, we're quite blind to it. It's so ordinary and so frequent. frequent that, you know, this habit blinds us. Because we maybe we never question, we never give us a space to be looked upon at something other than my habits, my attachment, my identification, my this, my that. It's mine, in other words. You know, so right speech is actually the most difficult, one of the most difficult part of our training. Because in a way, speech, if you really can reflect on this, it's what you think, isn't it? Thinking breaks into speech. If you are not thinking, you might not talk. And most of our thinking, most of our, you know, talking comes from thinking. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so, um, as I said, we can understand very quickly through our intellectual uh, ability, through our knowledge of our thoughts, our thinking, and so on. We can re we can get it. We get it straight away. A wise speech, you know, to refrain from, you know, lying, to refrain from slandering, to refrain from verbal abuse, and to refrain from gossiping. I mean, everybody knows those words, don't we? Now, it's very easy for, for ourselves to start creating a judgment about what is not what the Buddha said, you notice. If you think like slandering, not lying, not, ab not abusing others, not um, you know, speaking for nothing, gossiping, talking about people, you know. Sometimes gossiping can be quite harmful, harmless. It's not like a big thing. But when you look more clearly, more deeply, more closely, you begin to see that talking about people when they are not there is quite harmful, isn't it? We create people without them having any knowledge, perhaps. And that can brings to the mind a very unpleasant feeling, having to to the feeling of regret, the feeling of feeling sorry, or feeling, uh, you know, the feeling of a bit of shame, feeling shameful about saying nasty things about other people or describing people in a way you think they are rather than the way they are truly. Yeah, judgment. <clears throat> it's all very habitual in the human world. You know, we use speech to defend ourselves. We can really. Uh, destroy somebody's reputation. You know, through our speech, we can create the hell, a, a world of hell for somebody else through our speech. Isn't it true? Not big hell, but hell enough to maybe enable a sense of harmony with between us and others to disappear, to be absent, to not be part of our life. And it really, it's, you know, our speech habits are so strong that we can't catch them so quickly. You know, we've said it because there's often an emotional charge behind our speech whether it's a judgment, whether it's anger, whether it's frustration, whether it's this, that, or the other, there's a kind of emotional charge that is much quicker than what we could do with our mindfulness, you know. Our mindfulness doesn't have time to catch what's happening. This is why the Buddha, you know, this is why when we meditate, we are also very much aware of the Vedana, the feelings, the sensation in the body, because even though they are there, we don't notice them. And often these are those feelings, emotions, you know, uh, sensation in the body, et cetera, et cetera, that propels us to say something we re re regret afterwards. Have you noticed that? So it's good to do a body meditation, to know a, a feeling in the body, the emotions that come, you can feel your emotion on a physical level, can't you? You can feel your anger physically. You don't need to think about the anger, just feel it, know it. <clears throat> because this anger and negativity can really color very much the, the, the words that we express to oneself, towards oneself or towards others. Very easy, isn't it? So I'm saying this because, you know, um, lying, that's a difficult one in our society, you know, because many people do things they don't dare saying to others, or they're ashamed of things they do. They maybe have nobody to help them to be at peace with what they've done, what they've said, what they have thought. You know, there's a lot of story of our human life that we, we, we feel embarrassed or, you know, regret or, you know, so we can easily 
distort the reality of our life without really thinking twice, you know, you see normal. So what you can do now is uh, just like everything, all the approach and attitude towards ourselves. You have the word forgiving, There's, it's one word that's really useful, forgiveness. A word of, you know, appreciating the fact that when we did certain things, we were not in full control of ourselves, of our mind and body. When we said things in a kind of anger, or in, a, in a way we were, you know, uh, judging others, creating others in our mind, in a way, you know, the, the kind of proliferation we get from just uh, projecting onto others the reality of our own mind and then start speaking from that place rather than going back to the here and now and saying, what's happening to my mind? Am I seeing reality or am I seeing my gossiping mind? Or am I seeing or my judging mind toward that person or that person? Do you understand? Yeah? How many times we get caught up with our own projections. And the mind is thinking about that, you know, and with, you know, if you don't challenge that, you're in trouble because perception changes too, change. Projection change very quickly. But for them to see them changing, then you have to be aware of them. You know, you have to be conscious. So. The speech is a pretty, it's pretty, not so difficult to see because it's come out, come out of your mouth. You know, you can hear yourself talking. So you learn to hear yourself speaking and then you will find out. Not to judge you for goodness sake, no. But just to get a bit clearer about how you come across to other people, to, towards yourself. Just to see how you can maybe understand a little bit better how to generate a sense of kindness and harmony with each other. I'm not saying it is, it's easy. It's very difficult, actually. There's something in us which is quite intent in having melodramas, <laughs> rather than peace and quiet. <laughs> Don't we like melodrama, the drama queen in ourselves? you know, oh, she did that to me again, you know. Every time I tell her not to do it, there it goes, there she goes again, doing the same old thing. I've told her a hundred times, <laughs> but she didn't hear it, or he didn't hear it. That's the trouble, you see. But sometimes people, you can tell them they don't hear it. Even ourselves, we say, be a, be a good person. Mama doesn't hear it necessarily. I have to really practice and develop the mind to get to full realization that this is true. This is a true, a true message, a useful message. So when you, um, you know, when you dwell into the, the whole air, air, arena or area of speech, reflect carefully that Right speech, you know, which is not refraining from lying, refraining from slandering, or refraining from backbiting, you know, refraining from verbal abusive speech, you know, refraining from gossiping and so on. Just use those words not as something you have to become. Yeah? You might never become somebody who does not gossip. You don't know yet. Maybe you will become, maybe you will turn into somebody who is totally disinterested in gossiping. If you practice correctly, that's what happened. But it's still hard work, it's still training. You know, it takes a lot of energy to steer the mind in the right direction. Right? It's like steering a horse, you know? <laughs> No, I told you not to go that way, but it still will go that way. So it's a patient training speech, like everything else, but it's even more, speech is more, it's more difficult because it's very visible, it's audible, 
And people will tell you back what you've said to them, or they will get angry with you if they don't like what you said, or even if you say something nice, if they don't like you or don't want to hear from you, they will be completely deluded, you know, and say any old things that fit them. <laughs> That's why we have to become quite independent in this path, you understand? You have to know for yourself what you've said, and you have to have the confidence to really support yourself as well. If people criticize you, if people hate you, if people, whatever, whatever negativity you are thrown, are thrown to you, you have to stand really still inside, knowing, knowing yourself, knowing your intention, what you've done. Don't be so, uh, you know, don't be too afraid of people or life or life situations, you know. It's very easy to fall back into the, the black hole of, I am not good, I'm not good enough, I'm terrible, I'm this, I'm that, you know. The mind is used to be very negative or judgmental. It's hard at work to actually sustain the positive, uh, uh, the positive energy of the mind without feeling a bit kind of maybe even stupid. Some people feel, you know, happy, clappy, all that sort of thing. I'm not really interested to be saying nice things all the time to people. I used to be a bit like that. I couldn't stand people being too sweet to me. <laughs> not just to me, but in general, to everything. <laughs> There's a word in English that I used to know very well. Uh, they kind of, the, you probably know it. <laughs> One who is always think life is wonderful, you know. Unfortunately, I have forgotten it in English. It's an English word. Anyway, you can remember those, um, you know, the, what the Buddha says about speech. And maybe I'll read you a little bit, you know. Here, someone abandoned lying. I'm not going to, to talk about when you're summoned to court, you know, that's good. That's good. We go, we go into more in depth, you know. So, Basically, well, maybe I'll read it to you, then maybe that, that speaks to you. When, when summoned to a court or to a meeting or to his relatives, so it's very relevant to us, isn't it? We, we, can go, we don't go to court that often, hopefully. We, 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 in our work, we do meet people a lot, you know, in our meeting or with our family, a presence at the end, sorry. So court or a meeting or to his relative's presence or to his guild or to the royal family's presence and question as a witness, thus, Sir Goodman, tell what you know. Then not knowing, he says, I do not know. Knowing, he says, I know. Don't you like the, the Buddha? He's so, so true, just direct, you know. Then not knowing, sorry, then not seeing, he says, I do not see. Seeing, he says, I see. He does not in full awareness speak falsehood for his own ends or for another's ends or for some petty worldly end. He abandons slander as one who is neither a repeater elsewhere of what is heard here for the purpose of causing division from these, not a repeater uh, to these, of what is heard elsewhere for the purpose of causing division from those, who is thus a reuniter of the divided, a promoter of friendships, Enjoying concord, rejoicing in concord, delighting in concord, he becomes a speaker of words that promotes concord. He abandons abuse. He becomes a speaker of such words as are innocent, pleasing to hear, to the ear, sorry, and lovable, as good to the heart, are civil, civil, sorry, desired from Desired of many and dear to many. He abandons gossip, are ones who tells that which is seasonable, factual, good, 
and the Dhamma and discipline, he speaks in season, sorry, he speaks in season speech worth recording, which is reasoned, definite and connected with good. I really encourage you to read this little passage on right speech. It's worthwhile, isn't it? To let those words sink in, not for you to remember them only, but to reflect on them, to bring about, you know, contemplate them, think about them, yeah? To inspire the mind to move towards what the Buddha is encouraging us to say or to use speech. So it's now nearly, um, we've got just over 15 minutes. If you have any question, I can see there are some questions here. <laughs> the last one. Um, does right speech also link with talking too much to others without being aware that you are taking up their time or even your own? I love this question. I'm still working on that. <laughs> I know that I know that I've known that situation very, very well. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> right speech is also training the mind to realize that people are, may have other things to do than listen to what you're saying, or you may have other things to do than carry on talking. <laughs> ah, I think I see, no, it's not, okay. But it's, again, it's very difficult thing to do. Do you know why? I remember thinking I like talking myself, not always. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes I don't say anything. I'm very happy to be silent. But when I was kind of sort of exploring, what is, it, what is it that makes me want to talk to people? You know, you know it, you know the answer. If you look inside you, you feel good. You feel happy. And as you feel happy, you just want to carry on. It's a feeling that leading is. You could stop, but that feeling of happiness keeps you going. Notice that. When you like somebody or when you feel like you enjoy, you know, that the enjoyment is present in you, you're very happy to let that feeling carry on. It's called greed. <laughs> you know, it's just happy to want more, want more. The greed is a, is a word that's such a negative connotation, you know, he's just enjoying a good moment and hoping it could last a, a longer time. <laughs> it's quite innocent in some ways, do you understand? But still, it's good to know. Uh, what is the role of the mantra? Okay, well, mantra are good not as a kind of magic thing. So in, our tra in our tradition, we don't have that. The Buddha doesn't want us to do the work. He doesn't want us to have a mantra that's going to um, you know, make the uh, divine entity happy to help us. <laughs> He's much more into do, into do what you have to do to get what you want, rather than pray and pray and chant and chant so God can hear you and listen to you. Maybe he does. Maybe the Buddha does too. Maybe everybody is interested in what you're doing. I don't know. But the mantra in our tradition is more like um, you could just use it to calm the mind down and to simplify your life for 10 minutes, you know, instead of thinking about 200 pro 20 different projects, you know, you just have a gentle word that you like. Maybe you enjoy saying. <clears throat> so we don't have the mantra like maybe in, in Indian tradition or in... Um, Christian tradition or the, you know. But some chanting we love very much, you know, like Buddham Deji Vitam Nani I don't remember it in Pali, but it doesn't matter. 
I will remember. I would remember it if I stopped and just let my mind empty for a little while. That is, I can tell you another while, another time. But this just little chant is a bit like a mantra, you know. That's it, I got it. Is I, I, I take refuge in the Buddha okay, until I reach Nibbana. I take refuge in the Dhamma until I reach Nibbana, etc. Right? But as I said, it's before, uh, mantras are more used to help the mind to slow down and calm down with an object in your mind that is maybe neutral or maybe affect the heart peacefully, you know, like, yeah. Thank you, I didn't think of it. Right. Okay, so the person has written, I'd, Thank you. I did not think of it as a kind of calming down the mind. Yeah, is that it? Can you say something? The person who wrote. No. Yeah. The person is gone. Maybe. So, any more questions? It's your time now. You might not have another chance for now. Do you have any question about meditation practice? No? Do you find meditation difficult? No. Oh well. I would say it's not difficult or it's easier in a group as we are doing today yes. because it um, gives us the feeling of being together with other people and uh, looking at this at the same um, idea and the way uh, and when when you talk about it, it makes it easier to meditate. For me, I don't know what the other people feel. Sure. And um, when you said mantra, for me a mantra, I I I. Uh, looking at observing the breath is like a mantra for me yes and um so it's easier to focus on something like the breath because i will know that there are quite a number of people who probably do the same and then come to a point where the breath isn't necessary any longer That's sometimes true. That's true. sometimes <laughs> and um, speech is for me very, very difficult, especially <laughs> if you live in a, um, with somebody and there's a dialogue going on. Well, now you can, you know, don't you want to be creative? Yes, but that creation <laughs> sometimes is not love, very helpful. We love the word creativity, don't we? Now, I can tell you from experience, so it's not just, you know, a nice story. But, you know, in a way, and I'm not saying it works all the time, but it's really interesting to see how, you know, you can actually change your life by changing the way you speak. I've had the experience of all kinds with my speech, you know, from bad to good to medium good to very good, etc. And when you live with people like I do, you know, all the time, you begin to see how your speech 
can affect you and others, you know. And people who are close to you, um, it's very important that no matter what those people say or do, and I'm not saying it's easy, it's a training, remember, <laughs> we're still at school <laughs> till the last breath, probably. You know, we'll continue to train the mind to go in the right direction because it keeps going, you know, maybe some the other way. So, you know, to, to, to find a way to, even when people are, are not nice or not, you know, that's their habits, you understand? Yes, but you have to recognize that. So when you know it's their habits, maybe you have the compassion to help them in one way. I don't give you a way of helping them, but you, the only way you can help them is by yourself doing something that you wish they would do. How about that? Yeah, but um, I find uh, that there is a point where you either spontaneously respond to something or you can actually stop for a moment and that's right. um, that's that's the point of changing something when i'm yeah. possible when it is possible to stop yeah that's right that's right because there's too much emotion behind the words yeah yeah so you can see the speech is one thing it's your thinking but what is driving is also your feelings. Yeah. And the feelings come from all these thoughts, don't worry, it's all mixed up together. When you have, you know, you say a meta, you do a meta meditation for a little while and you don't resist it and you do it, you know, guided meta, you feel much nicer. You know, by the end of it, you can actually be friend with a person you couldn't talk before with, you know, because you're emotions have become more tolerant, maybe more peaceful, more kind, more slow down and so on, you know, less reactive. So many things can change through that. You understand? Yeah. And, you know, when I, I you know, I, I talk to you from experience. I mean, I li we live very closely to each other or even my own family, you know, and uh, it, it does pay off, you know, to, Take a risk, you know, to be kind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it seemed like from what you tell me, it seemed like you have already done some practice with it, so you know what to do in a way, you know. I sometimes forget. Well, that's what happened when um, our mindfulness goes out of the window, you know, but it's you know, words can be very misleading. You know, when I say my mindfulness goes out of the window, it can think a big thing. It's just one moment where you were busy with other things, you didn't think about what you're going to say. Do you understand? Yeah. It's not, it's not a big deal. It's just like one moment, maybe your, your, your pizza in the oven, you know, <laughs> got forgotten and you realize, oops, and then you say something not very kind to the other person, maybe. Like, why didn't you take it out? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you had to take it out, you see. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's great, isn't it, to share the, the fact that we all have suffer from the same predicament. <laughs> yeah. Now we suffer, but we also have a way out of suffering, as you know from the Buddha's teaching, that he's taught us a pathway, a clear pathway to go, to let go of that, you know, habit to constantly churn up suffering and moan about suffering. <laughs> I think rather than moaning about suffering, it would be much better to have compassion for your suffering. Don't you sing, Juanita? Juanita? Yeah. It's all right. You don't. You can remain anonymous. <laughs> well, as long as it doesn't disintegrate, it's a problem with words. You know, so, compassion can disintegrate into self-pity if it's directed at oneself. So, 
you know, <laughs> well, it depends how you how you use the words and how you feel it. I, I want to tell you something. Then you're going to see here something maybe new tonight. I don't know. It's up to you. I don't know. When it's you're right. You know, I've 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 been through this. I know that feeling. You know, because I I, I was you know averse to the idea of meta. You know, at first I couldn't stand it. As soon as I heard the word meta. Even though I'm, 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 you know, a fairly kind heart on the whole, you know, I used to think I go into kind of irritation and aversion, you know, I don't want all that meta stuff, you know. And you say you fall into, <laughs> you fall into the deep hole of self pity. But you know, this is what happens as long as you are identified with your self. Do you understand? Don't worry, it's a stage. As long as you are identified with yourself, you are not doing it. This is happening to you. Do you understand? What is happening? Mm. Do you don't see that this person, which you call me, you, needs compassion just as much as a thousand Chinese, Burmese, and African and American, and so on, you know? Mm. That you're just one of them. You're just mm. one body and mind out of millions of people. And if you feel that sense of falling down the hole of self-pity, it's because you, yeah, you haven't got a balance yet. Do you understand? It's not you, mm. I say. This is not you that experience. It's an experience. Mm. So little by little, you know, you begin to see yourself just as, as another human being. We need love and kindness as much as any billion being around you. Is that too much? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the problem of words, always the problem of words, how you interpret them. <laughs> let's say you know I, i'm talking about stories now i'm not we're talking about words you know <laughs> so but, but what i'm saying to you is that don't worry about feeling pity i mean it's very common feeling that people have at first you know because they are more used to feel the sense of uh, sense of honor the sense of strength the sense of living up to what you think is good and so on and so on, you know. So having compassion towards yourself, you know, I mean, I have a whole story for that, that myself. When I remember when I arrived at the cottage of the nuns that became our house for me for several years, near Chita, at Chitterst, you know, I remember seeing on the wall the, the meta chant, may I abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom. I mean, I did not know how to chant it, of course, now I know. But I thought, this is strange. I was not even a Christian myself. I just read many books on spirituality at the time. And uh, I did some retreat in Christian monastery on my own, I remember. And I remember I was used to hear that thinking about oneself first was selfish. <laughs> Isn't it? You were used to hear that, don't we? And so the idea of sending metta to yourself first in that chant was really shocking for me. Why should I give metta mm. to me before everybody else? Mm. Now, when you meditate, you begin to see that if your mind is not in a good space, how can you help other people? Your mind is your world, do you understand? Mm. And if your world is miserable, you're going to have a hard time giving happiness to others. No matter what you wish, you know, it's not easy. Mm. Because in a way, we don't realize that we're not just a, a thinking mind. We are an energetic body and mind. And people, no matter how nice you will be to them, if you're still angry with yourself and upset and you know unkind and judgmental and so on, they will feel more the negativity than the words of kindness you're saying sometimes. Or they'll be confused. Is 
that's an incentive to know yourself better, I tell you. So one doesn't have to develop or to wish oneself, you know, the, you know, this feeling to work with this feeling of compassion until one is ready. I mean, the Dharma is not a, you know, force feeling path. The Dharma is something that is enabling understanding, understanding our mind, understanding of ourselves. That's all. It's not like pushing your, the Dharma into your throat, you know and forcing you to be compassionate, because the Buddha said so. No. Mm. You learn to be compassionate when you can see how much you suffer. The more I was aware of my own suffering, the more I felt more compassionate to others and compassionate to myself. Does that make sense? No? No. Well, if we don't have any more questions, and it's about three minutes past eight, we could do the final chant, you know, the final, what they call the closing chant, traditional closing chant, which we do at the end of the morning, our morning chanting and at the end of our evening chanting closing homage. That's the one. We can do it all together, shall we? Let's do it. We bow. Sawaka to Bhagavata Dhammo Dhamma Namasami <clears throat> Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sanga Namami So I think I see you again one more time in July, sometimes. In the meantime, I wish you very well. And I hope that you devote, devote uh, a little bit of time just to get more familiar with not only the word of the Buddha, but also with your meditation practice, you know, which really is a deepening of those words into your heart, mind, body. Yeah? Into your whole life. So, wishing you well, and uh, I'm going to say goodbye, or au revoir in French, shall we say? <laughs>